back. i uh, going to introduce Graham, who's going to start the presentation on his HailSat, uh, and then I'll uh, finish off with the uh, TV aspects of it. So over to you, Graham. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, uh, I seem to have lost my voice, or it's, it's gone a bit weird after last night, so I don't know whether you... you know, did you yeah. chats make me talk too much, or was I drinking too much? I'm not sure. Um, those who, of you who were at Finningley last year will have seen and heard talk before of as Hale sat or as Hale 2 as being something really radical for us uh, in the world, world of amateur TV. Um, and I think last year, uh, Peter, um, Peter Blakebro and myself were saying next year. Well, those of you who know anything about space and rocket launches will be aware that delays are almost inevitable. And originally, we were hearing that it was going to be launched at the end of this year, so I was expecting that Dave and I could be talking now in September about a launch of this spacecraft in October or November, and it would be really up-to-date and important. Well, it's still up-to-date and important, but uh, a couple of months ago, we heard that the launch had been delayed till Q3 2017, so about a, year, about a year away. And then just last week, or a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, uh, there was a rather large event on a launch pad at Cape Canaveral, which took out a Falcon 9 rocket, very sadly, with a... Um, about, they'd only put the, the payload, the 280 million pound or dollar payload, the, the, the satellite on top a few hours before, and then the wretched thing blew up. Uh, spectacularly, but they don't say an explosion, of course, it's an event. Um, <laughs> so, um, there was a press release from SpaceX who are doing this rocket launch, or who, who run this, uh, this rocket, um, last night about the update, and they think they found what's happened. It all blew up in 93 milliseconds from absolutely all the 5,000 channels of telemetry being completely normal to no telemetry was 93 milliseconds. So there's no certainty yet of when they will start restart launching. But I, I would guess that probably Q3 2017 is still a good aim point for, the, for this, this, uh, this spacecraft. So as Hail 2, a geostationary, what's going to make it so different for us? We've had lots of amateur satellites, but we've never had a, a geostationary one. And it's ge not only is it geostationary, but it's got two transponders, bent pipes, uh, linear transponders, one 250 kilohertz designed for voice and CW and narrowband stuff, and one that's eight megahertz wide, uh, which is intended for wider data rates or bigger data rates, wider signals, and obviously, therefore, DATV. Um, <coughs> just a quick reminder um, about spacecraft and a few acronyms. Most amateur satellites, in fact, all currently are in LEO, which is in low Earth orbit. The pink stuff there are the radiation belts, um, the Van Allen belts, where you don't want to spend too long because it tends to upset your chips and things. Um, there have been some in what's described there as HEO, high Earth orbit, uh, actually, where um, the perigee, where it gets very close to the Earth but then goes right out a long way, We've never had any in MEO, which is a medium Earth orbit, which is generally between the two radiation belts. And as I said, we've never had any in GEO, which are geostationary. The great advantage, as we all know, is that you don't have to keep going out and moving your dish uh, for a, a geostationary spacecraft. Um, so I think I've probably said most of that. Uh, it's a geostationary spacecraft, two linear transponders, a 15-year lifespan, uh, S... <coughs> S-band uplink and X-band downlink. Um, this is the timeline. Like all these projects, they take an awful long time to get uh, underway and completed. Um, there again, Q3 2017 for the launch. Um, I wouldn't stake my life on it at the moment. Uh, I think last year some, uh, we were being asked what um, uh, as hail means, and it's a autumn star um, that appears in the night sky as summer turns to autumn, which if you're in the Middle East is a really nice time because it's cooling down, as a number of people will know. 
So oh, what I should start by saying is actually all of these slides have been borrowed uh, from AMSAT DL. So if, if Peter DB2OS is watching, thank you, Peter. I uh, appreciate your support for letting me use these, these slides of yours and, and allowing me to modify a couple as well. Um, so um, geostationary spacecraft, it covers a third of the Earth. It's located at 25.5 degrees, or will be 25.5 degrees east. And those of you who know, east of south, Mr. Chairman, abbreviated to 25 degrees east, uh, which is really, really close to where all our sky, uh, in the UK, all the sky signals come from, I think, just a total of three spacecraft now uh, at 28.2. So they're less than, it's less than three degrees away. So if you can get sky signals on a, on, a, on a dish, then most likely you'll be able to see as hell too, which is really good news. So that's the coverage um, in, in one, displayed in one form, a bit easier perhaps to see it in a traditional sort of map of the world. It covers, it will cover from the uh, east side of Brazil over to Malaysia, all of Africa of course, and all of the UK and other interesting places like Antarctica as well. Um, most geostationary spacecraft broadcast with spot beams covering, if not individual countries, they're very localised beams covering just the UK and uh, bits of France and stuff in some cases. And we don't want that, of course. We want what, what is called a global beam in satellite terms, um, which means that you have to have a 3 dB bandwidth on the transmitting or oh, sorry, on, on the aerials on the spacecraft at about uh, 17 degrees, which calculates back to about 20 dB of antenna gain on the spacecraft. What we don't know, um, the antenna certainly for the for X-band um, uh, uplink, sorry, for S-band uplink uh, is a horn. In fact, I think they're both horns, but the S-band uplink is on a horn, and quite what the polar diagram of that horn is like we're, I'm not absolutely certain, I'm not sure that anybody is. So therefore, there is a degree of uncertainty on the link budgets up. I think on the downlink for uh, uh, ATV, certainly with DVBS2, etc., and you'll hear more about this from Dave, um, we're fairly clear as to where we are. I think the, uncertain, the fundamental uncertainty is going to be how much power we need to generate to what sort of size dish for the uplink for ATV. Uh, particularly, and I think that will vary depending on exactly where you are in that, um, in the co coverage area. Um, a couple of slides here that show where to point your dish. If you're in Bochum, which is where AMSAT DL are headquartered in Germany, Doha, which is the launching state, um, and far east, uh, sorry, far west in Rio, and if you're in Penang in, on the Malaysian Peninsula. So you can see the coverage is fairly enormous. Now, actually, on the satellite, it's a, a simple, well, not simple, but a simple bent pipe. Um, two bent pipes the an the, that shares the receive antenna, splits into two, through two transponders, a narrow band and a wide band, um, mixed up to 10 gigs, amplify with TWTs, and then put through pass, uh, bandpass filters. And I wasn't sure what TC on that, that means. Oh, good, I'm not the only one. Off. Um, and then, then putting it together into one antenna, combining it into one antenna. Test coupler, is it? Thank you. I'm not surprised I didn't get it then. Yeah, could well be. Um, so uh, all the uplinks are right-hand circular. The narrowband downlink is vertical, and the wideband downlink uh, is, uh, is horizontal. Uh, that, so briefly, uh, the transponder, the narrowband transponder, um, fairly straightforward, uh, conventional 250 kilohertz of bandwidth, uh, non-inverting transponder bent pipe, um, and you can see there the size of dish that you might need. Um, personally, I think that's pessimistic. I think we'll be able to receive signals with very, very small and simple antennas. But we've said the rest there. Yep. Um, they've decided to have an initial stab at a 
pass band, or, sorry, as a, as a band plan for the, for the transponder, for the narrowband transponder. They will be generating beacons. Previous satellites have generated their own beacons on the spacecraft. Here we haven't got that facility. So engineering beacons and data beacons, telemetry beacons, will actually be generated on the ground and uplinked at either end of the passband uh, on the narrowband transponder. Uh, the wideband transponder I'm going to pass quickly over because this is where Dave is going to talk to us some more. Um, but again, it shows there that... Uh, uh, for the, it's assuming a 2.4 metre dish for the uplink, but a much smaller uh, X-band link, link, sorry, X-band dish for the downlink. And some rather nice graph there that shows the shoulders are at 50 or 60 dB down. Uh, in numbers terms, um, a 60 or 90 metre a centimetre dish, LMB, uh, DVBT dongle, uh, or a fun cube dongle, or any other dongle for the reception of the narrowband. Transmission about 10 watts to a 60 or 90 metre dish, 90 centimetre dish. And then DVB, uh, DVB-S2 I will leave. Um, that's a sort of a band plan, not a band plan, but a usage chart which shows the respective frequencies. We are up at the top end of our allocation at 10.5 gigs, <coughs> primarily because the TWTs are only operate the spec down to, I think, 10.65 gigs. So we're taking them slightly out of their design um, limits, but um, testing has been done and they work okay. Um, but obviously we wanted to be as close as we could be, but not too close. <clears throat> so they're, they are building a satellite control center uh, over in Qatar. Um, and there is a dish there that, as you can see, Peter is standing there with a local engineer, which says 2.4 meter AMSAT. So for SHL2. So we will have, or they will have, their allocated ground station, um, which will be controlling the spacecraft. It will have a number of bits of kit, standard transceivers for narrowband. It will also have something called LILA2. Um, on previous narrowband uh, GTO type uh, uh, spacecraft, the, the Germans have had something called LILA, which was a horrid thing that came along and sat on you if you were running too much power on the input. It came along and and made a beeping noise on top of your signal. And that was all built into the spacecraft. And then if you carried on, it actually notched you out. So that shut you up. Uh, again, they haven't, it's not possible to have that on board uh, this commercial spacecraft. So that, that will be created on the ground. Um, and it will have a similar effect. It's actually being built in part by uh, Howard uh, um, from the Funcube dongle um, G6 LVB from uh, his um, small facility, his kitchen table. Uh, that just shows the shack that's planned for the, uh, for the uh, command station out in Doha. And as you can see, they are planning to have some uh, ATV stuff there as well as the conventional TS-2000. Uh, so they're, in, they're planning to use DVB-S2 as an uplink and for the downlink, they're using SR systems equipment. Well, that's what they're planning. So finally, the, from me anyway, the status uh, is that the c satellite itself has passed CDR, critical design review. It's doing some final, being final testing underway, undertaken at the moment. And with a big caveat as exactly when next year, or hopefully next year, uh, it's going to be launched next year from Cape Canaveral. And at that point, uh, here is just a list of some of the partners. So AMSAT DL are recognising both AMSAT UK and BATC as partners. And at that point, I'll hand over to Dave to talk about what our involvement is going to be. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much, Graham. That's great. Um, AMSAT in Germany uh, requested some BATC help on this um, because we seem to have been the central hub for DATV experience, although there's bits in the States and there's some marvellous expertise in France as well. 
Um, as we've heard, a uh, bent pipe transponder. But how are we going to use this? I mean, there are so many modes. We've heard already about DVBS and S2, QPSK, 8PSK. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be up in the 16 or 32 APSK. Um, we've got all the various error corrections you can use, all the various symbol rates, and all the video, video codecs. Um, Occupied bandwidth, are we going to use the whole thing or are we just going to use a little bit of this 8 megs? And of course most of our current activity is on uh, DVBS QPSK. <coughs> I'm actually surprised we haven't seen this diagram before today. Um, it's well worth understanding this, I feel. Up the side here, we're talking about how spectrally efficient we are, how much information we can get into a certain bandwidth. Along here, we're talking about the carrier to noise ratio, so how much signal you need to do it. And we're currently using DVBS. That dot there is FEC a half, uh, which is the most noise tolerant uh, error correction, but of course is the least efficient on getting data through. So we're currently going up and down here. Now, some of our receivers, we don't think um, at low, uh, when we're doing reduced bandwidth TV, we're getting all this gain from going to FEC a half, which is why we're running FEC 7 eighths up here for the reduced bandwidth stuff. But we're, we're working here. Uh, we've recently done some tests with QPSK. Um, and we've proven that with QPSK, you can get this 2 dB, sorry, with QPSK DB, DVBS2, you can get this 2 dB improvement there um, in needing 2 dB less signal to get the same information through. Uh, we've heard about 8PSK. 8PSK is great for spectral uh, efficiency, but look how much more signal you need to get it through. And the other big theme of the weekend, I think, has been shoulders when you're uh, amplifying signals and how difficult it is to get linear power. So we, we currently work there. It would be nice to work down here where you need a lot less dBs of, of power, but we need the technical ability to do it. How are we going to know what people are running on this thing? so you can tune into them. You know, tuning in Minitune, you've got to put all those parameters in. If you're using commercial receiver, you've at least got to put the symbol rate and the frequency in. So what we were thinking is we can perhaps help the community coordinate this. And um, we've proposed to uh, the Germans and the Qataris uh, to have a spectrum monitor, a web-based spectrum monitor. So this is a sort of development on um, some of the software-defined radios you see on the web. Um, on the right-hand side there, a spectrum display showing the 8 megs and showing what's, what's on the satellite. So you can instantly see what the occupancy is. You can get an idea of the bandwidth. So you could, might be able to guess what the parameters are that you need. But hang on, let's have a chat channel on the right and say, actually, I'm transmitting on this frequency with these parameters. Or, who is this? What is that? So we can get that dialogue going. Okay. We've, uh, Phil has done a mock-up of this. This was using an air spy as the uh, receiver with an LNB uh, with a couple of um, transmitters there. And you can actually see the shoulders on the right-hand one. Not good. I did wind it up intentionally, but there you go. Um, we're going to need a frequency plan. I think as more people get DVBS2 capability, we can amend this frequency, nearer, uh, frequency plan nearer to launch. You know, things are changing in the transmitting community. I don't think we need to make any early decisions, and we need to be flexible after launch. And perhaps we vary the usage on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, reception of the thing. 
A small dish should work. By small, I mean 80 centimetres. Not your, not your Sky Mini dish, but a larger Sky dish. Um, we can use uh, phase lock look LNBs. You know, the octagon LNB that we saw yesterday. Um, however, the IF is going to be outside a normal satellite receiver passband. It's going to come out at 741 megs. So, how do we get around this? We can use a modified local oscillator LNB. Um, there used to be some available from Germany with 9 gigs LNB. Uh, uh, DROs in. Um, I did see on the forum somebody has posted that you can now buy, and I think they were about 80 euros, uh, octagon LNBs with modified local oscillators, phase lock loop, which could be the, the major solution. You can use a wider frequency range tuner. It's not a problem with the sharp tuner and mini tune or the new tuner we heard about yesterday from Jean Pierre. Or you can use an up converter, uh, the SUP2400 that the BATC shop sell. Or G0 MRF, David, is designing a down converter for the narrowband segment, which converts the narrowband segment out of an LNB down to 146. Well, actually, that's got a high side product that's in the satellite band, and that is usable. So, you can use the standard, our standard receive setup for that. Talk about the uplink then. 2.401 to 09. Um, the Wi Fi channel 1 is on 2412. Might not be very neighbour friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put your put your neighbours on five gigs is my view. Um, clearly, we mustn't cause interference. I've already gone to five gigs on my Wi-Fi. Um, spectral regrowth and the cha a channel interference will be a real interview, a real issue. Okay, how do we generate this? We can generate at a lower frequency and up convert. So we can use a standard DTX1, DigiLite, DATV Express. Um, up converters. You can use your 13 SEMS narrowband up converter if you've got one, but watch the frequency because, of course, the narrowband segment is 80 megs away. Uh, Kuna in Germany sell an up converter around 500 euros, uh, which is, looks nicely engineered if you've got the money. Second option is you can generate directly at 2400. Uh, DATV Express will do that. You need your PC, but actually this is going to be a home station setup primarily anyway, so not an issue. <coughs> DigiLite will work at 2.4 gigs. Um, getting the uh, shoulders down is a challenge, but it can be done. DTX1. Lawrence, yep. is the new DTX1... Doing 2.4 gigs? Um, we have a process, sorry, and I've got it with me. Doing two, I have two capable of doing 2.4 gigs. Um, the output's somewhat low. Um, right, but, okay. But no, it's usable. Okay, so we can get a signal out of a DTX1. The only issue with it is, in providing that, we've removed one of the filters. Is that the filter on the synthesizer, which was limiting it um, to prevent stereo and lower bands? So now, if you make that mod, um, you run the risk. If you also use a down and lower band, you might get some... Okay, so what well, Lawrence said for the stream was, by removing the filter that allows it to work on 2.4 gigs, uh, you get more spurious on the lower bands. But there is a solution. Yes. Great, the, thank you. The plan, sorry, the plan is to write an article for the magazine. People are doing themselves. Basically, you remove a very few surface mount bits and replace some of them Brilliant. Thank you. We look forward to hearing about that. That's great. All these solutions are low power, so you need to have some amplification. How about amplification? We're not really sure yet. We've seen some of the power budget figures. Um, Rob M0DTS 
did this slide, which I think is, is really useful. What we can do is reduce the bandwidth. So if we go down to half a meg's worth of bandwidth, so we run RBTV, suddenly you're looking at a 1.2 metre dish with 25 watts. We're back into the realm of the possible, the realm of the easily doable. So I think we can do a lot with TV on the satellite with um, fairly simple kit, especially if we can start to make those gains from DVBS2. I think we can re do really well. Uh, spectral regrowth. We've heard a lot about that. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, the good and the ugly and the achievable. DVBS2. Uh, AMSAT DL want, want it used, I think, because they're broadcast influenced, they're perhaps SR systems influenced, where this technology is available. But given that the biggest challenge, I think, is going to be power output and linearity, I think we're going to be with DVBS2 QPSK, you know, down the left hand end of that chart that I showed you, um, and not on the 8PSK up there in the middle. I think I've just said that, but we have demonstrated this S to S2 advantage of um, 2db we demonstrated that on air um, I know on air tests aren't brilliant but it was confirmed uh, the other week SR systems if you want to transmit nice DVBS to SR systems can give you a hardware solution for it at a price um, but I would re recommend DATV Express with the new software you're going to hear about shortly. On receive, I think, we'll be into Mini Tuner Pro by the time this thing's launched. So thank you, Jean-Pierre. I think that's the ideal solution. And we'll be able to receive both transmissions on the satellite or with two sets, four transmissions. So I think this is, you know... <coughs> There's going to be lots of experimentation here. There's lots of scope for experimentation. Um, we need some flexible solutions on the ground station because I think lots of people are going to be running different modes. But we need to coordinate it. And I think in Start Simple, it's going to enliven ATV because most people will be able to see some activity from around the world on amateur TV with a reasonable sized dish in their garden and I'm really looking forward to it. So, um, that concludes my sh slides. Uh, Graham and I are ready to take questions. Uh, there's one there. Thanks, Jeff. G4HIZ. How do you control access to the satellite? Uh, you don't. Right, so immediately you, it, it says we're ready. 100 operators in the US start up and you're blocked. No, no, ah, it, okay, all right. Eddie, Anywhere. It's a global coverage, so it covers a lot of... Yeah, yeah we, whatever. We are, we are looking at the procedures we use to try and ensure that there is proper use of it. And we're, we are in discussion as to what techniques we might use to do that and what escalation levels we need to put in place so that we don't get the thing permanently shut down. But that is a very, very big challenge, and that was my first view on hearing of the project. Okay. Quick technical question. Now, the payload itself is piggybacked on a commercial satellite, mm -hmm. and it's, is it built by AMSAT DL as such? No, the no. payload is is a Mitsubishi okay. commercial payload. So it's a commercial payload. I saw an early presentation of this payload and it described it as building with COTS equipment. That's not the case then. No, no, no it is. Okay. Isn't. All right, thanks a lot. It's an integral part of... A space qualified system. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I could just add that the, the uh, it's all built by Metco, which is Mitsubishi. It's all completely space qualified and it's using effectively some of their spare TWTs 
um, which they would normally have, I don't know, 10 spares to maintain their life, and they've allocated two for our use. The, the reason the frequencies are dictated as they are, my understanding, the reason the frequencies are dictated as they are for an S-band uplink is that the command and control of the spacecraft is on 2.2 gigs thereabouts. So we're coming through the top end of that receive system and going back out on the bottom end of their commercial broadcast end. That, that's what we're doing. Uh, the, and the other point to note is there is no AGC on the transponder, I think, which you would not have. This gentleman made an interesting point there, because the satellite telecommand and control is on 2.4 No, no, it's 2.2. 2.2, mm. not a million miles away. So you've got to be careful about spirits coming out of your 2.4 gig uplink. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Graham, for uh, getting this going. Thank you. Applause for Dave. Applause for Graham. <laughs> <laughs>